Well, thank you, Maddie. That was Maddie Black playing that uh, beautiful prelude for us. Thank you very much. We're glad to welcome you all, all of you today. We're glad you're here to worship with us. And uh, if you're a visitor today, we extend a special welcome to you and vegetation. Uh, some of you might see Rob back there somewhere. Uh, he was going to be gone today. He's been gone all week, so I am doing the sermon today, even though he snuck back a day early, but uh, he's here to enjoy it as well. But uh, remind people of the midweek manna will continue this Wednesday. I started the book of Jonah uh, this past Wednesday, and there's handouts on the table outside the entrance. If you'd like to take that with an outline, you could, you could follow through. Also, unfortunately, the, the Helping International Students Farm Festival at the Phil Bushes has been postponed uh, because of the COVID thing and all of the concerns. Hopefully rescheduled for this spring, I understand. So we'll look forward to that in a few months, probably. Uh, but also, many, many of you saw the table out in the entryway with some activities for the youth. Justin has been out there and has lots of things planned for the youth. There's some things that they need some adult help with, maybe certain activities that maybe you could help supervise. There's some donations they could use. So if you'd want to look at that table after the service, See if there's any there's sign-up sheets for all the different activities. Maybe there's something there that you could uh, help with or provide something for. We'd encourage you to do that. Also, last week, Adam Burns shared briefly about how we're beginning to look as a church at, at some potential ways to hopefully open up some more ministries, our Sunday school, nursery, some of those things again. And, and the CE committee, the Christian Education Committee, was tasked with the responsibility to try to, to develop a, a workable plan. And, and this past Thursday, we met. Just wanted to let you know that... that Progress is being made. We have something we'll be presenting to the elders. That's not till October 14th is the next elder meeting. Doesn't mean things will open up right after that. It, it, it's still a process, but we're, we're working on it. And we just wanted to let you know that we're, we're in process on that whole thing. Well, as, as I'm sure all of you know, this past Tuesday, uh, the Lord in his goodness ushered our dear friend Judy Day into his presence in heaven. And uh, as I think most of you are aware, too, this, this coming weekend on Friday evening, Friday afternoon and evening from 4.30 4 to 7.30, there will be a public visitation here at the church. Uh, Al and his family will all be here, and uh, people can congregate outside as well. They'll have some tables out there. The family has asked that anyone that come, that you, you please wear a face covering and, and social distance. There'll be people coming from, from lots of different places, so they've asked that we respect that. Uh, if you come to, to honor them. And that's a public. Any, anyone is welcome to join us for that. Then on Saturday morning at 11 will be the private funeral service. It, it is private, uh, but I would mention, as we've had advertised to, it will be live streamed. If you're on Facebook, you could go to our, our Community Bible Church Facebook page, and at 11 o'clock it should pop up. You could watch it live. If you're not able to watch it then and want to view it, you could view it later on. It will still be on the Facebook page as well as on Monday. Uh, Casey will download it, and it'll be on our YouTube page as well. So you'll all have an opportunity to, to view that funeral if you'd like. But uh, the funeral on, at 11 on Saturday is, is a private funeral. And then also the last announcement I would make is that uh, next Sunday in between services, we plan to have just a brief kind of prayer of dedication and thanksgiving. And we're asking families, we're going to, going to encircle the church at 1010. That's in between the two services. So if you come to the second service, we'd encourage you to come early. So that you could join us and we'd like to have you be in family units or couples or individuals and surround the church we'll have a sheet that will be prepared with a prayer it's going to be very brief but at a certain designated time we would just ask that you would offer that prayer as, as a thanksgiving to god for for this church building that he's blessed us with and i was thinking the past couple of weeks how appropriate the timing of this is because it was exactly 35 years ago this month that community bible church met for the first time as an incorporated church. It was September 29th, 1985. I, I still remember the date, date well. And, and uh, we met for the first time at Prem's Pride Motel, which no longer exists. It, it, we met in the basement of that. Small group of dedicated people that were there. And again, uh, since Rob's been gone all week, I'll, I'll be bringing the sermon today. I've got a few more people this time than I had when we were in the basement of Prem's Pride that first time. And, and uh, I'd like to point out that uh, it's also appropriate but this past Tuesday is when God decided to take Judy home because uh, Judy and Al, as we all know, were a main part of this church. And uh, certainly it's the Lord that had his hand in everything that has been done. But we would also acknowledge that Judy and Al Day were some of the main foundational people to not only found the church, but then to further the ministry of this church. And so next week, very briefly, we'll have an opportunity to not only thank God for this building, but to thank him for 35 years of faithfulness to this church. I'd ask you to bow for a word of prayer. Father, we come to you. 
We look to you and are grateful for your faithfulness and the way you have led this church body for 35 years. Lord, there have been lots of changes, but you've been there through all of them, guiding them and leading them, and we trust that you will continue to do that until Christ returns. Father, we come today now to lift up your name, to sing songs of praise to you, to look to your word together. We would ask, Father, that most of all, the name of Jesus Christ would be lifted up and glorified and magnified because it's through him that we have life, and it's through him that we pray now in his name. Amen. Good morning. Would you please stand and help us praise our Lord and Savior.
fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Strength of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious honor, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mouth I fix upon it, how thy glory redeeming love. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home. Now your grace is always with me and I'm to you and know that you are with us always you never leave us your love is always there for us your forgiveness the holy God the creator of the universe loves us so much that you offer your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness to anyone who wants it we worship you this morning and we thank you for that grace and that love.
sweet the sound. Lord, we come into your presence today because of your grace, because you have called us freely. We thank you, Father, for that grace. And as we look at it today, we pray you'll give us a deeper understanding and appreciation of it as we come into your presence boldly to the throne of grace to worship you and to come to you. Father, thank you for your presence in Jesus' name. Grace. It's a word we use in a lot of different ways. We talk about giving grace before a meal. We talk about having a grace period. Your insurance policies do on a certain day, but they give you a 30-day grace period in which you can pay it if, if without a penalty. We talk about uh, someone dancing, maybe a ballerina dancing with such wonderful grace. If you're musically inclined, you know that sometimes written into a score of music, our grace notes. Sometimes we talk about a, a beautiful bouquet of flowers gracing a table. Grace is used to describe a lot of things, but the most important aspect of grace is God's grace. And we want to focus on that today. It's a foundational truth in the scripture. It's foundational for us to understand as believers, but yet it's a truth that sometimes is misunderstood, it's misapplied, it's misinterpreted, and yet it is absolutely essential. And so I want to deal with a question today, and that is, what's so amazing about grace? We sing the song, we've all sung it a hundred times or more. What does it mean that grace is so amazing? For many of you here today, what I'm going to share is old hat. You've heard this before, you've probably heard me share it before. Some of you might be here today and have never heard it explained like this. And the rest of you might be somewhere in the middle. But no matter where we're at, I believe these truths are a good reminder to us of God's grace and what it means to us. And at the same time, there's times you might have the opportunity to explain God's grace to someone else. And I'm hoping maybe what I share today might help equip you to better share that truth with someone else that might say, what is this grace that you Christians talk about? Well, the first question beyond the big one that we're going to ask is, what is grace? Lots of ways it could be defined, but I want to define it this way. That grace is God's divine blessing freely given to people who do not deserve it and cannot earn it. It's God's divine blessing freely given. Now, as we're going to see, it's not cheap. It costs Jesus everything, but it's free to us, but we can't deserve it and there's no way we can earn it. Sometimes a simple definition is just that it means unmerited favor, undeserved favor. Now, when we talk about grace in the scripture, there, there's different kinds of grace. The one we're going to talk about primarily today is, is the grace we need for salvation. There's also the grace of, of the spiritual gifts that God blesses us with. They're called a grace. We know that we have to live our life by grace as well. We don't live it by the law, we live it by grace. It's like a, a child being born, a baby being born. When that baby is first born, what do they have to do when they first come out of the womb? They better start breathing. They better take a breath. The first time they take a breath on their own of oxygen. 
Let's say that oxygen is grace. When we're born again by faith in Christ, what does that baby have to do the rest of their life? They have to keep breathing that oxygen. We're saved by grace, but we have to keep living by grace the rest of our life. Now, the question is, what does grace look like? And, and the old cliche that a picture is worth a thousand words is true, but we're not going to look at a literal picture, but a portrait in Scripture, a very familiar passage to many people. If you turn your Bibles to, to Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, we're only going to be looking at a portion of this parable today, but in this parable of the prodigal son, very familiar to most of us, we have a beautiful picture of God's grace. It helps us understand it. As Jesus was ministering to the people, some of the Pharisees and the religious leaders were, were grumbling about him eating and, and having fellowship with tax collectors and other sinners, and, and, and he was answering their question of why he associates with sinners by giving three parables. He gave the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and then in verses 11 through 32, he launches into the parable of the prodigal son, or the parable of the lost son. And I'd like to just walk through this and make some comments about it, and then we're going to draw some things for us. So if you're in Luke chapter 15, first of all, in verses 11 and 12, we see this son's request for riches. And Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided it, divided his wealth between them. Now, it seems strange that this son is asking for his inheritance early, but you could do that. Uh, a father could, could decide to give that to his, his sons if he wanted. He had two sons, so we know the eldest son would have gotten a double portion. So this guy would have to divide his estate into three portions, give two of them to the older son, and the younger son got a third of it. That was the system in that day. And notice the father did it. He gave it to him. But the, the key question is, why is this son asking for his fa father's estate, his share of it? I think it gets back to that this son desired freedom. He wanted to have freedom from his father's authority. And by getting his share of the inheritance, he could leave and live on his own and not be under his father's authority. We have to remember in this parable, who does the father represent? He represents God. And we have a lot of people in the world saying, I want freedom from God. I don't want to be under God's authority. And so I want to have personal freedom. We're going to see where that led this young man in a moment. But uh, look at verse 13, where we see his rebellion. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Went to a distant country. This was a Jewish boy with a Jewish father and a Jewish brother, and he was in the land of Israel. To go to a distant country meant that he went to Gentile area which was not a place of blessing for an Israelite. The land of Israel was where they wanted to be. So he left his own country, went to a distant country. It says he, he, he gathered up his things. He had to you know, get his bags packed. He had to go to the bank and get the money out and stuffed his pockets with all that cash, and he took off. Went to the distant country and, and squandered it all on loose living. You can use your own imagination to the types of things he probably was involved with as he went to this distant country. But then, look at verses 14 through 16, where we see the results of his rebellion. It says, now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. Pretty soon the pockets were empty and a famine hit and he had nothing. And so he hires on as a, as a servant for someone who sends him out to feed pigs. We know he's not in Israel country anymore. Jewish people did not raise pigs. They were unclean to them. Probably the most degrading job that you could have had if you were a Jew was to have to feed pigs. And I'm sure that detail was not lost on the Pharisees and the religious leaders he was talking to who would have understood the depth of the degradation for someone to be feeding pigs. And yet that's what happened to this young man. And he longed to, to even eat what the pigs were eating. He had no food. But look at that phrase, no one 
was giving him anything to eat. He's gone out into the world. He needs desperate help. He wanted to get out from under his father's bondage. He had his freedom, but he came right back into bondage. That's how life is sometimes. We think we want freedom, but when we get there, we end up back in bondage because we haven't put ourselves under God's authority. Notice, though, that no one would help him. The world can't help us with our most important needs. The world cannot give us the grace that we need for salvation. It can only be found in Jesus Christ. You might be thinking at this point, well, this young pup's getting everything he deserved. Let him wallow in that pig slop for a little longer till he learns his lesson. But look what he does now in, in uh, verses 17 through 19 as we see what I believe is a, a response of true repentance from this son. It says, but when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. First thing he realizes is the reality of his hopelessness. He came to his senses. He realized it was hopeless. Then he recognized his sinfulness. He said, I'll tell my father I, I've sinned in your sight and in the sight of heaven. He didn't just say, I've sinned against my father. He understood, I've sinned against the God of heaven. And he understood that sinfulness. And then he, he recognized his unworthiness. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me like a hired man. A hired man had no, no privileges in that day. Had no rights other than working for their master. And he was willing to put himself back under his father, not as a son, but as a, as a servant that had no rights whatsoever. Then we move to verse 20. This is my favorite verse. Verse 20 says, So he got up, came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. While he was still a long ways off, his father saw him coming. I like to picture this. If they would have had binoculars in that day, this dad was sitting on the porch every day with those binoculars, watching, praying that this son would come home. And I have a feeling, you know, we all have a distinct walk. People that you know, you, you know their walk. And I think he saw his son from a distance and he could tell, that's my boy. He's coming back. And what was the father's response? He felt compassion for him. Who does the father represent? He represents God. God has compassion for us as well. In spite of this son's rebellion, in spite of all that he had done, the father had compassion for him. And then a little phrase that we often overlook says, and he ran, he ran to embrace and kiss his son. I've read that in the Near Eastern culture, for a man, especially an older man probably, that would be wearing a robe, for them to run, and you ladies that wear long dresses, you know how hard it is to run in a long dress. The men wore long robes. If they were going to run, they had to hike it up a little so that they could run. In that Near Eastern culture, it was considered very undignified for a man to do that, to lift their robe and to run. And yet, that's what this father did. I read a wonderful story one time about a Muslim man who a Christian was, was sharing the gospel with him and sharing truths about Christ. And one thing they did was went through the, the parable of the prodigal son together. And to make a long story short, this Muslim man came to faith in Jesus Christ. He became a believer. And he said, you know, one of the main things that, that drew me to your God was in that parable of the prodigal son when it said that that father ran to his son. And it dawned on me that if your God loves me so much that he's willing to do something so undignified as hiking up his robe and running, that's a God I want to serve. 
That's a God that I want to go to. He ran to him. He embraced him. He kissed him. I'm sure this young boy had had no shower before he came home. He traveled probably several miles. He was disheveled. He probably smelled like pigs. I grew up on a farm in Iowa. My father raised pigs. I know what pigs smell like. I know what it's like to wallow in the slop and have it get on your clothes. It doesn't come out until it gets washed. And yet this father embraced him and kissed him. I think the most important thing, is, though, is to see what the father didn't do. When that son came home and he reached him, he reached out to him, he didn't rebuke him. He didn't reproach him. He didn't say, I told you so. I told you if you take my money and run off, you're going to blow it and you're going to end up in a mess. Now get in there and clean up and come back here and we're going to have a long talk about this. He didn't do that. He showed compassion. He loved his son. Well, the son begins his repentance speech in verse 21. It says, And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He starts to share what he was going to share, but then the father interrupts and says, But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf. Kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. The father says, quickly, bring out the best robe. Putting a robe on his son was a sign of saying, he's one of my heirs. Think of Joseph in the Old Testament. Jacob gave Joseph the multicolored robe. It made his brothers all jealous. Joseph was the next to the youngest of those 12 sons. He was not the firstborn who should have gotten the double portion. But we know that eventually, as time went on, the line of Joseph received the double portion in the land of Israel because Joseph was honored with a robe. We know that when Joseph was placed in second in command under Pharaoh after he was released from prison, he was given a signet ring. That signet ring was a sign of authority. Joseph could do business in the Pharaoh's name. For this son to be given a, a ring wasn't just to decorate his finger. It was to show honor to him and that he had authority as a son. Sandals were put on the son. In that day, servants didn't wear sandals. Sons did. And he said, kill the fatted calf. Kill the fatted calf. We're going to celebrate. We're going to have a party. When I was young growing up, I, I think I kind of understood what this idea of a fatted calf meant, but it wasn't until I was in Swaziland, Africa, many, many years ago, and uh, I saw it firsthand. We went out in a rural area one time for a wedding, and uh, the Swazi people normally eat a lot of chicken, a lot of goats, but not a lot of beef. That's kind of safe for special times. But we went out and we were at this place where this wedding took place and some of the men told someone else, go get the fatted calf. And they had a calf that they had put aside for a special occasion. And I watched them slaughter that calf and cut it up and a few hours later we were eating the fatted calf that was prepared for a special occasion. That's what this father chose for his son. The father rejoices. It's time to celebrate, he says. They had a banquet. Often in the scripture, a banquet represents the kingdom of God. And eating with Christ in the banquet represents that we are in his kingdom. We have a restored relationship with him. And that's what this father was saying to this son. You have all the rights and privileges of a son because of my grace. This son did not deserve anything, but his father gave him everything because of his repentance as he came back. Now, I wish we had time to look at the older son who was a son who did not accept the grace. He thought he was good enough without it. And the father went out and invited him to the banquet, said, come in, it's for you too. But it says the older son refused to come in. He's a picture of someone who refuses 
to accept God's grace. But the younger son did. Well, now with that, I want to move to a couple of other questions and start to flesh this out for us. The question I would ask is, why do we need grace? And again, for many of you, this, this is things you're, you're well aware of, but the answer to be, would be that we need grace because we are separated from God and we have no ability to restore the relationship through our own efforts. We are separated from a holy God. We have no ability to fix the problem ourselves. Why are we separated? Well, the scripture teaches that we are all born, because of Adam's sin, we are all born with a sin nature. We are born with it. It's not something we acquire when we're 10 years old or when we commit our first sin. We just have it because of Adam. Paul tells us in Romans 5, 12, that through one man, Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin. And death spread to all men because all have sinned. All people, except for Jesus Christ, have had and will have a sin nature that separates us from God. And without a solution to that problem, we're separated for eternity. A common belief today among people in the world, and unfortunately, even many people sitting in churches across America and across the world, a very common belief is, well, surely if I'm just a pretty good person, God will let me into heaven. Surely if my good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, that'll be good enough. That's one reason we have a lot of religious rituals that get developed. Sometimes it's the idea of if I, if I just go through these rituals weekly or daily or monthly or whenever, surely that will earn me some favor with God. That, that will, will make it easier for me to get into heaven. Well, those things might be okay things to do, but none of them merit us eternal life. We cannot fix that problem ourselves. And why is that? The reason is if we want to get into heaven on our own merits, we have to be perfectly sinless. Perfectly sinless. James tells us in the book of James chapter 2, whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles on one point is guilty of all. If we had a hundred guidelines that we were supposed to live by and you did 99 of them perfectly but you messed up on the last one, you're disqualified. We would need to be perfect. Illustration I might use, if some of you are coffee drinkers. Some of you like to desecrate a good cup of coffee by putting lots of cream and sugar in it. You don't drink it pure. But let's say that somebody, you know, I'm going to give Steve a cup of coffee, and I, I pour the cup of coffee for him, and I know he likes cream and sugar in it, so I said, how much do you want? Oh, put a couple packs of the cream in and a couple packs of sugar, and I stir it up, and I said, well, I got one more thing I want to put in, Steve, and I pull out a little bottle of arsenic poison, and I just put one tiny little drop in, barely a drop, and I stir it, and I say, here you go, Steve. If Steve is smart, and he is, what's he going to tell me? I don't want that. Why? Well, it's got arsenic in it. I said, well, it's just got a little drop. But the rest of that whole cup is, is perfectly good coffee and cream and sugar. But you see, one little drop contaminated the whole cup. All it would take to contaminate us would be one sin. We have to be perfect. Now, you might be saying, well, how can we do that? We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But the bottom line is we are contaminated with our sin nature. Well, then we move to the third question. And that is, what's the basis for grace? On what basis can God offer us grace? If, if we deserve separation, how can he be fair? How can he do something that would just give it to us freely, like this prodigal son that came back? Well, first of all, the basis for God's offer of grace is the sinless sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's how he can offer it to us. We know from many places in Scripture, but Romans 5.8 says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, Peter writes that we, we've been redeemed not by things that are temporary, like, like silver and gold, but by the precious blood of a lamb, the unblemished and untarnished blood of Jesus Christ. He paid the price. He has offered the payment for us. We know that to have a substitute, 
blood has to be shed. The writer of Hebrews tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and they recognized they were naked, they tried to cover themselves with leaves, what did God do before he sent them out of the garden as a discipline, but also a sign of his grace? God killed animals and covered them with skin. Because even after the first sin, blood had to be shed for there to be forgiveness. When God covered them with those animal skins, it was probably the first time animals had ever been killed. But God did it because there had to be a blood substitute. Jesus came and offered that blood substitute. When we talk about grace, there are some truths around that we have to understand. We have to understand that Jesus is God. We call it the deity of Christ because only if Christ is God could he offer a sinless sacrifice. He was fully human because then he could die for us. But his sacrifice on the cross was the payment, but his resurrection was necessary because that was the Father looking down and saying, I have fully accepted your sacrifice on behalf of humanity. And then there's the fact, as we're going to see, that we need to come to faith. But this crucifixion of Christ, his deity, his sacrifice for us, this is the crux of Christianity. This is the, the very core of what we believe. If we take the crucifixion and resurrection out, as I've often said, we might as well all go home. We're wasting our time here. Only through what Christ did is there any offer of salvation. This sets true Christianity apart from every other religion in the world, every other philosophy, every other mindset. Christianity is not just like any other religion. It is absolutely unique, but we need to understand this grace to, to be certain of that. Well, then the question is, what's the basis for experiencing it? Well, the basis for experiencing God's grace is our faith in Jesus Christ. In the verses I've quoted many times, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not according to works so that no one should boast. Paul makes it crystal clear, it's a gift. It's not by your good works. It's not by your religious rituals. None of those earn you favor with God. They might be nice things to do, and doing good deeds is a good thing to do, but we do them from the motive of God has blessed us with his grace and then they flow out of us. Just because grace has been offered to the world does not mean that everyone experiences it. That's a false belief that many in the world hold and again, many people sitting in churches across the world. Well, because Christ died for our sins, that means everybody's going to heaven because he died for everybody's sins and that's the way it is. We can rejoice that everybody's going to heaven. That's not at all what the scripture teaches. The scripture teaches that first of all, we have to come to faith in Jesus Christ. We have to be like this prodigal son who recognizes the reality of our situation, that we are in a hopeless situation, that we are sinful people who cannot fix our sin problem, that we need a savior and we need to look to him in, in true repentance, recognize our unworthiness and let him take care of our need. The very first beatitude that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 5 was, Blessed are the what? Poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What he meant was, blessed are those who recognize their spiritual poverty. Those who recognize that they cannot be good enough to get into my kingdom on their own merits. They humbly come acknowledging their need. We all need grace. Whether you are an honest, upstanding, respected person in the community, or whether you have a rap sheet that's a mile long, you need the same grace for salvation. Whether you are someone like I had the privilege of being born into a Christian family and have attended church all my life, almost every Sunday of my life, or whether you've never darkened the door of a church, we all need the same grace to have salvation. It's because of what Christ offered to us. Now with that, I'd move to some other related lessons here. The first is that we, we've really touched on this. Eternal salvation is not something we can earn. 
It is a gift we receive by grace. We can't earn it. It's a gift, and we simply have to accept it. Remember I said earlier, to get into heaven, how good do we have to be? We have to be perfectly sinless. And you're right if you say there's no way we can do that. That's true. That's why we need grace, because the Scripture teaches that when we come to faith in Christ, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus, who was sinless, took our sin, and when we put our faith in Him, we then become the righteousness of God. That doesn't mean we live a sinless life the rest of our life, but what it means is that our standing before God is secure because as God the Father looks down on us, if we have placed our faith in Christ, He looks at us through the blood of Jesus Christ and He says, that's my son, that's my daughter, as they have come to me in faith. Another point is that eternal salvation is not based on what we do for God. It is based solely on what God has already done for us. It's not based on what we do for God, but rather on what God's done for us. Salvation can be free only because the giver of that grace has already paid the cost. Jesus said seven things that are recorded while he was on the cross. One of the most special is when he said, it is finished. To tell us die, which means paid in full. When Jesus offered his sacrifice, when he died, the penalty for the sins of the world was paid in full. The work was fully accomplished. God does have wrath towards sin. And one day he will judge the unbelieving world with his wrath. But when Jesus died on the cross, he took the wrath of God for us. John tells us in the book of 1 John that he himself is the propitiation for our sin. You say, what in the world is propitiation? It's just a big word that means he's the satisfaction for our sins. He satisfied God's wrath. Most of us here know what a lightning rod is. I grew up on my farm again in Iowa, and our barn had two, two lightning rods on each peak. A lightning rod is there. It's, it's a metal rod that sticks up. It's high because we know that a lightning bolt is going to strike a, the highest point, and it's going to be drawn to metal. Now, I'm not an electrician. I don't understand all the specifics, but basically, if a light, bolt of lightning hit, it would hopefully strike that lightning rod and it would go and it would be grounded. And it would not burn the barn down because it's protected by the lightning rod. I like to picture Jesus Christ on the cross as being like a lightning rod that went up in the air. And God the Father says, I have to pour my wrath out because of the sin of the world. And I'm going to pour it out, all of it, in full force on my son. Who lived a sinless life and gave a perfect sacrifice. And if you can picture that full wrath of God coming down and striking his son, bringing him to death, that's what God has done for us. Fully what he has accomplished. If we understand that our salvation is not based on what we do for God, but on what He's already done for us. Who gets the glory for our salvation? If our salvation is because of our good works, then we get the glory. We can boast about it. But if it's totally based on what God has done for us, God gets all the glory. And that's the way it should be, because He has accomplished all of it. Another lesson is, our truth, that our lives are never so bad that we're beyond the reach of God's grace, but they're never so good that we're beyond the need for God's grace. We've never been so bad, we, can, we cannot do enough bad things so that we're beyond God's reach of grasp, but we're never so good that we don't need it. This brings it down to us. 
Maybe you're here today. Sometimes people have this attitude. Yes, we need to acknowledge our unworthiness. But there are some people who say, oh, but Lindsay, you don't know. I don't only have a mile-long rap sheet. I've got a three-mile-long rap sheet. Surely God can accept me. Just don't know how bad I've been. God says, I don't care how bad you've been. If you will accept my grace, I'm giving it to you freely. We're never so bad that we're beyond the reach of God's grace. But also, another problem with grace is that many people in the world have, and this would be very prevalent, is pride. We honestly think we don't need God's grace. Again, the world thinks that because they think they're good enough, and of course they may not even believe in God, they may not believe in heaven or hell, you know, they don't believe maybe anything, many of them, but unfortunately many people in church even feel like, well, I don't know that I really need God's grace. We desperately need it just to breathe air the rest of this day. We need God's grace no matter how good we might appear on the outside. Another issue, and I touched on this in my midweek manna with the book of Jonah, if you happen to watch that, this will be a little bit of a repeat. Sometimes our attitude is a lot like Jonah. We love God's grace for us. We love it for our friends and our relatives. But we're not so sure we like God offering grace to those people. And you can fill in the blanks. Maybe it's a nationality. Maybe it's people from a certain religion. Maybe it's those abortion doctors. Maybe it's those sex traffickers with kids that, that we look at and we think, that is so horrendous. I really don't care whether God offers his grace to them or not. They don't deserve it. Neither did we. All people need God's grace. And I would challenge us to check our attitudes toward other people. In this political year, it might be the Republicans we think aren't worth being saved, or the Democrats that we don't think are worth being saved because we just despise some of their beliefs. We're in the same position. We all need that grace. The hymn we sung, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing. I, I love that first line. Come Thou Found of Every Blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Tune my heart, Lord, to sing your grace. Our hearts are like a musical instrument that needs to be tuned every time before it's played. I'd encourage us each morning when we get up to say, Lord, tune my heart today to your grace. Help me to understand it and to show grace to other people, even those that I might despise, because you died for them just as you died for me. And then finally, there might be some of you here today who are thinking, you know, I have a prodigal son, or I have a prodigal daughter, or I have a prodigal grandchild that I'm concerned about. Or some of you might honestly say, I have a prodigal parent that I'm concerned about. Anyone that, that we would acknowledge has not come under the authority of Jesus Christ because they, 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 they want their freedom and they don't feel that they need his grace. Some of you might be here today and would have to admit, if you were honest, I'm a prodigal son. I'm a prodigal daughter. If so, that's okay. God has an answer for it. Whatever your situation, I would encourage you that as long as you are breathing, as long as that child or grandchild or parent or whoever it is that you're concerned about is breathing, it's not too late. Keep praying. Keep praying. Keep praying. And if you admit that you're a prodigal child, I would encourage you to avail yourself to the amazing grace of God that he offers to us freely and accept that gift so that you too have eternal life. The world can't offer us grace, but God can. Jesus Christ can. No matter what we've done in the past, no matter what we're doing now, no matter how messy our life might be, Christ offers us his grace. Today, as we've looked at some issues surrounding your grace, that it would help us 
come to a clearer understanding of it and how we might communicate it with others and how you need to receive all of the glory for, for everything that happens in our lives. Lord, we thank you that as the song says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Father, we would be totally lost without your grace, but by it we can have eternal life and be certain of that. Father, we come today now offering our lives to you humbly as a prodigal son did and accepting your grace and then allowing you to live through us as you bring glory through our lives to Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen.